Morning, everybody. Hope everyone is well. Missed seeing you last week. Sorry I had something come up that I was not able to teach, but we're back again today. Baruch Hashem. Uh, so this week I want to get started um, right away. I want to jump in and um, go through our normal our normal um, uh, framework here. So I want to start by, by saying thank yous. Um, of course, thank you to uh, Hashem for us coming together again another week. Baruch Hashem. I want to thank uh, Rabbi Yosef Mizrahi, who uh, was so generous in helping me to identify sources for this shiur for us to learn from. I'm very thankful, and I want to thank also my husband, who um, helped me translate those sources, since my uh, Hebrew in, in, in learning in Hebrew is very challenging for me. Um, so he sat with me, and he went through all of that together with me, which was very, very helpful. Um, I wanted to uh, dedicate the shiur for some uh, refua. Again, if you have anyone you want to dedicate the shiur for, please go ahead and put it in the chat. Um, a refua shlema for Eliezer Moshe ben Shulamit, Chaya Shein Alea bas Shulamis, Henya Rivka bas Bracha Devor Alea, Daniel ben Chana, Alfred ben Regina, uh, Shidduch for um, Aviva bas Bracha, as well as uh, Emma bas Sara. Um, and Ayala Beka Basia Fashendol. Anyone else? Feel free to go ahead and put it in the in the chat, and we'll dedicate our learning for whatever is needed for Am Yisrael. Okay. Um, last week I was going to. Good morning. I was going to tell you guys about a tzaddik, Chacham Rabbi Ezra Rubin Dangur. His year site was on January sixth. Um, you can you can look him up um, if you're interested. This week we have uh, a big uh, a big yard site coming up. We have uh, the Hula of Rabbi Moshe Ben Maimon, the Rambam. So he is on the 20th of Teves, which this year falls out on January 13th. Um, Obviously, one of the most influential um, rabbeim in Jewish history. I'm going to read a little bit about him from the biography on the uh, Tzadikim site, popularly known as Rambam, after the initials of his name. Halachist commentator and philosopher, the Rambam's soul was from a very high level in Shar Hagil Golim. Of Rabbi Yitzchak Luria, the Ari, he states the Rambam is from the left sideburn, therefore he did not merit to know the wisdom of the Zohar. But the Rambam is from the right sideburn, and therefore he merited to know the wisdom. Uh, oh, but Rabbi Moshe ben Nachman merited knowing the wisdom of the Zohar. Rambam received his first Torah instruction from his father, a noted scholar, Rabbi, dating back to the ancestry of Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi, compiler of the Mishnah. At age 23, Rambam began writing his commentary on the Mishnah, Perush Hamishnayos, in Arabic. Um, let me continue down. There's so much written about him, Baruch Hashem. Um, he became, um, he wrote the introduction in Tractate Brachos, also known as Shmona Parakim, eight chapters, deals with diseases and cures of man's soul, prophecy, reward and punishment, free will, and the rule of the golden mean. In his commentary on the Tractate Sanhedrin, he enunciates the 13 principles of the Jewish faith. So, the Shastri Karim is one is a is found right after Aleinu in the Siddur, and it's something that everyone is encouraged to say every day um, as a reminder of the foundational pieces of Judaism and of living a Torah life. Uh, Rambam was the one in his review of the literature uh, that had existed at that time that he went through and he pulled out what he believed were to be the most primary themes and the most instrumental pieces of being Jewish and living a Torah life. And so that's all captured in these in these 13 principles of faith. Um, and it's said that by, you know, it, it's, there's so much around that, basically. It's, it says flat out that if someone is uh, wanting to convert, convert to Judaism, for example, and, um, and they're shown the 13 principles, and let's say they say, well, I'll, I, I agree to 
keep or I, I believe in 12 of the 13, you're not allowed to convert them. So this is a fundamental element of all of the Jewish religion is the idea uh, of this 13 principles that Rambam is the one who brought into being um, for our people. And obviously is one of the greatest commentators um, and written the greatest commentary that's referenced most frequently in all of Torah. So um, big, big, big tzaddik, big chilula. Um, obviously, he was also, if you know, he was also a medical doctor. He was uh, requested to be the medical doctor of the king at the time and so forth. So definitely somebody worth spending a few minutes on and learning about and um, in lighting a candle for. So again, that's on the 20th of Tevas, with this year falls out on January 13th. So I believe that would mean the night of the 12th and then the day of the 13th. Okay. All right. Let me put this aside. Okay, fantastic. So this week, I want to focus on this concept of intention. Intention. In Hebrew, it's also known as kavana. Um, But we're going to look at it from a few different angles. We're going to look at it from a psychological perspective, and we're going to look at it from um, a religious perspective. Um, from the standpoint of how Judaism handles concepts of intention and concepts of kavana. So if I, if I say the word to you, intention, um, what, what comes to mind? What are you, what do you think about? How does it resonate with you? Where does it apply in your lives? How, what, what is intention? For me, it reminds me of Ratzon, will. Okay. It's linked to will. What is my will? Okay. Or will, or, or be, or be Hashem's will. And then develop the intention from there. Okay, so you're so when you think of intention, it for you it, it ties to uh, a person's will, and then from there it feeds into intention. Um, Julia wrote in the chat, mindfulness, being extra present when I'm doing something. Okay, very good. What else? Anyone want to add to that? Okay, we can work from there. So the idea of uh, intention is tying directly to what you are meaning behind uh, uh, words, actions, and intention is found predominantly in your thought. Okay, so again, very interesting that I, our very, very, very first year way back when was all about the idea of thought. So we see really how heavily rooted our existence is in the ability to think and what it means for us to have a thought process and how important it is. So today, when we begin to talk about this concept of intention, you're going to really begin to understand how does God use intention to understand us as individuals and to know us, to know us, to know what is the truth that exists within each of us. So Everybody knows, <clears throat> all of us at some point or another are capable of being good actors and actresses, right? The face that we put on out in the world um, is oftentimes not matching the thoughts and feelings that we have internally. So I, I always joke, especially when I'm dealing with, let's say, young people, or not necessarily young, the age doesn't really matter, but about shiduchim as an example. I always say the majority of people can behave well on a short-term basis. All of us can act for a certain period of time. Some of us are capable of doing it for longer periods of time, some of us less so, but the bottom line is that when we are acting, we're not really sharing the MS about what we think or who we are. Um, and so that would mean that our action and our verbiage, our speech, does not necessarily match our intention or our internal working. 
So the idea of intention, especially in a Torah space and especially in living a Jewish life, is really tied very foundationally to MS, to truth. Does that make sense? Okay, so when we're talking about what is our intention or what is any given person's intention, we're talking about what is the absolute truth, not a version of the truth, not a segment of the truth. What is absolute truth? So what we have to understand And I'm going to start by sharing a story to demonstrate this. And really the truth is the story is so powerful that we could probably just end the shiur there after five minutes. Okay. But we won't. We'll discuss and we'll further. And I have other sources to, you know, to, to bring to light. But I want to, I want to start with a story that very, uh, very much Hashkacha Pratis came to me that when I was planning for this shiur, uh, my husband shared a story with me on some of the literature that he receives before every Shabbos and this story happened to have been in that literature for Shabbos and I told my husband this is absolutely perfect to demonstrate the idea behind intention. So the story is a true story. The story took place during the time of the Chafetz Chaim and the story was told by the son-in-law of the Chafetz Chaim, Harav Aaron Cohen. Harav Aaron Cohen had gone on a job interview to be a congregational rabbi back in the day. And he so really wanted to get this job. He really wanted to be in this kind of leadership position and, and lead this particular congregation. And at the end of the day, he didn't get the job. And he was really disappointed. And the Chafetz Chaim saw that he was kind of down about this. So the Chafetz Chaim shared with him a story to help him in his process of, of understanding that Hakol Mishamayim, everything is, is from Hashem. But he made him promise, he made Harav Aaron Cohen promise not to share the story with anyone until after the Chafetz Chaim had passed away. So this story didn't actually come to light until after the Chafetz Chaim left this world and went to the next, okay? So the story is like this. The Chafetz Chaim explained to Arav Cohen that earlier in his career, he had actually held positions of, uh, uh, of such prominence within communities where he was the rabbi of a community and of course on the base dean and so on and so forth. And he, and he had, he was deeply involved in all the goings on of the community. And he told of a story of a butcher in the community who had been found to be selling non-kosher meat to the community. And so, of course, immediately the Chafetz Chaim had to revoke his, you know, his, his privileges of, of being a shochet and selling and being a butcher in the community. And, um, and, and the rabbi, rabbi, the Chafetz Chaim gave this rabbi a financial penalty. Okay. Uh, in t- tied to this, to this matter. Several years later, after the butcher had passed away, the Chafetz Chaim had been in his shul learning, and he went to the Ezra's Nashim, which of course nobody was there. He went to the Ezra's Nashim to rest, and he laid down to rest a little bit, and he was woken from his sleep by the Beistin Shelmala. He woke up, and three of the Beistin Shelmala were standing in front of him. And they told him, catch your breath, because he was startled, of course, as we all probably would be if Pete Om uh, suddenly out of nowhere, three men are standing there who you can see are holy Kadosh, people not from this world. He clearly probably had recognized them. It's not articulated in the story who was on the base scene at that time, but most likely the Chafetz Chaim being the Chafetz Chaim knew exactly who they were and exactly where they were coming from, and it kind of took his breath away. And so the Rabbanim on the base team told him, okay, t- take a minute, take a minute, catch your breath. We, everything is fine. We're not, we're not here for you. We need, we need to know something from you in a particular case that we're judging right now in Shemaim. So the Chafetz Chaim composed himself 
And then the base dean posed this question. Are you familiar with such and such, the butcher who was uh, found to be selling non-kosher meat to the Jewish community? And the Chafetz Chaim, of course, said, yes, um, of course, I'm, I'm familiar with that case. I was the... I was the on the base team. I was maybe maybe he was even the head of the base team or in the community. And so the question that they posed the Chavetz Chaim was this: When you gave this man a fine for his actions, was this fine as a punishment for his action, or was it in kapara for his action? Kapara means that it's a partial atonement for his action. Are you understanding the difference? One is a punishment, like a fine, like anybody would get a fine for doing something wrong. The other is kapara, is an atonement, meaning by paying that money, the butcher was then somehow cleansing at least a part of the the avera, the sin that he had done. So the Chafetz Chaim thought for a moment, and he told the Beistin, the fine was as a punishment. So the Beistin Shamala said, thank you very much, and they left. Okay? So the next day, when the rabbi was sleeping, the butcher came to him. And he said, Rabbi, you don't know what you did for me. You don't know, you don't know what you've done to me. I told them in the Beistin Shamala that the fine was for a kapara, an atonement. But you told them it's for a punishment. And now I have to do all of my, he's going to be obviously punished. He has to pay the price for his actions in the Solam from the Beistin Shamala, right? In his judgment. So what is, so two things about it. What does this story show us? Number one, it showed us that the intention behind any action is so great and so important, both here and in Shamaim, that it was enough to make the members of the Beistin Shamala come into this physical world, wake up the Chafetz Chaim in the middle of this man's trial to learn exactly what was the Chafetz Chaim's intention in giving that fine. It shows us not only is the intention absolutely critical, but it shows you that in Beistin Shamala, they're not going to take your word for it. Right? So this butcher said, oh, no, no, the, the fine was for kapara, kapara, kapara. And they said, you know what? We need to know because everything here is exact. There's no ish, ish. Everything is mida, connected mida to the T, to the point. So they had to understand the Chafetz Chaim's intention in giving that fine before they could come to a fair and accurate judgment in Shamaim for this butcher. So it shows us point blank the importance of our intention behind every single thing that we do. And the Chafetz Chaim shared this story with his son-in-law to tell him, you have no idea what a responsibility it is to be a communal rabbi. Because Every single thing you do in the context of community as someone in leadership position is viewed and measured even in Shammai and has direct impact on every member of that community. And so he was basically trying to say to his son-in-law, never fear, don't worry. Hashem probably did you a solid favor by letting you not take that job. I'm sure you're going to go on to great, great things in a different capacity. And sure enough, of course, he did. But the point here that this story so beautifully articulates is that we will absolutely, with absolute certainty, be held accountable Not just for what we do, not just for what we say, not just for how we pray, not just for our stakot and how we give them, but the intention, the MS of the intention, not what we try to convince ourselves is our intention, not what we try to convince other people is our intention, but the absolute MS in Shemaim that they see and that Hashem knows in every nook and cranny of every human being what was actually meant 
at the time that something was said or at the time an action was taken. There is nothing that goes unseen or unknown by HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Uh, there's a question in the chat. Cannot the punishment also be a way of kapara? Only if it's given with the intention of it being so. And in this case, in the Beistin Shalmala, they did not know what the Chafetz Chaim's intentions were. And if the Chafetz Chaim did not intend for that fine to be also as kapara, then it's not. Does that make sense? Okay. Awesome, that's great. So then, when something, so when something bitter happened for us, did um, did you say bitter when something bitter happens? Bitter. To use the, a better word. Yeah. So when something bitter happened for us, it would be advisable to take this, not necess- not just maybe as a punishment, but we take this suffering and say like, I deserve it. Uh, And this is for my own good, like intentionally, like with purpose that we receive it. We, I don't know, we heard our toe. And then we can say, perhaps out loud, if possible, at least for ourselves to hear, like, I deserve it. This also is for my good. Hundred advisable. Yes. We receive it, so this not just be a punishment for this world, but also be something that can be used for afterlife. One hundred percent. I have a great story about that exa- as well that highlights that exact point. This is also a true story, and absolutely, you should teach your kids this. Someone in the so she said, "Can we teach our kids this?" One hundred percent. So when you take anything, first of all, we know. Let's just back up based on what you just said. We know hakolatova. Hakol le tova. Everything is for the best. Hashem, there are no mistakes. There are no accidents. There are no coincidences. Everything that happens in this world to us directly, to us indirectly, and to everyone around us, hakol le tova. And there are no accidents and nothing is by mistake. So if we know this and we internalize this and we understand this, then to do as you said, to say, Magiali, I deserve it, right? To own it, whatever it is, to say thank you, Akadosh Baruch Hu, I know this is also for the best, is to elevate anything and everything that's happening to you. Because now you're taking it, and instead of it being lost on you or just floating by, you're actually giving it significant meaning, right? And that is a beauty of the Bechira, of the choice that Hashem gifts us with as human beings. That we have the choice to do that. We, we can either succumb to the Yetzer Hara that wants to pull us down into the mud and prefer, preferably keep us there, right? Chas v'shalom. And that we continue to beat ourselves up and beat ourselves up and beat ourselves up, right? They say that one time of beating yourself up is enough and then you have to move on. Anything else beyond that goes to the Yetzer Hara. You're gifting him. Okay? So Hashem wants to see that the message is not being lost. Hashem, Hashem wants to see that what's happening around you is being acknowledged and being, t- you know, taken in for use, for digestion. But beyond that, anytime you continue to beat yourself up and remind yourself of, of old bad behaviors and, and feel horrible, this is all food for the Yetzer Hara. Okay? So... We need to, uh, by accepting the things that happen with us, right, and by trying to recognize any type of intention and try to ask ourselves questions about what do I need to learn from this instant, what happened here, then we can begin to put intention and meaning and process the situation with Kavana and to juice from the event, to take the juice, to take the, the meaningful nugget that we're supposed to learn from and grow from as a building block, as a stepping stone to go to the next level. It's very, obviously, it's very challenging to do that because we're in, when we are in the throes of pain and suffering, it's very hard to get a, a grip enough 
to be able to become very, very present and very conscious um, to, to begin to now elevate and ask ourselves questions at a higher level while in the parallel experiencing the nature and the pain of the situation. So this is, this is a part of the work, but this is also a part of what shows us that intention is so vital to everything that we do, both actions that we, that we take and things that happen to us. Okay. Can you please expand the meaning of why in Hebrews, Lama and Madua, Lama, why? Uh, what do you, what, explain to me what you, what you mean by your question. Sure. Um, cause I want to link what you say about, like, was it, what do I need to learn from this? Yes. I believe that word why in Hebrew, because Hebrew as I'm learning is a very definitive language. Yeah. So everything has a meaning behind. It's different than when we say why in English or why in Portuguese or Spanish. That does, why does not mean anything. So I know that there is a difference between lama and madea. madea madua. Uh, madua. So madua, I, okay, I'm not an expert in Hebrew, but I can just tell you there's maybe other people in the class that know Hebrew much better than me. Madua is coming from, from, from the word um, um, yodea, to know. You know, so there's, there's a relationship, I think, in those words, unless I'm wrong, if I'm off on the shorish, on the root of the word. Lama, I'm really not so sure about. But I can tell you one thing about this word why, regardless of which word you're using in Hebrew. There's a difference between asking yourself the question, okay, why is this in my movie? Why is this happening to me, right? Or saying, why is this happening to me? Poor me, I'm the victim. Why is God doing this to me? right? There's a completely different intention and mental construct behind those two questions. Same words, completely different intention. To ask it with a level of consciousness to say, okay, this is in my movie for a reason. I came into this world with my curriculum and this is a part of my learning process that Hashem set up for me in my classroom called my life. And I need to really get down and deep into why this is going on so that I can grow and learn from it because that's my job. That's why I'm here in this physical world right now versus throwing yourself into why me, why me, poor me, poor me, and just like, you know, laying in it and not getting anything from it and feeling like a victim. Right. So I'll share with you the story that I heard. I actually just heard it this past week. Um, in Israel, there's a very, very big problem with uh, accidents and road rage. There's a tremendous amount of traffic, similar to what there is here in L.A. Um, but in Israel, there's a, there are a lot of motorcycles. There's a lot of chaos on the roads. And people are very triggered and they're very aggressive. In general, Israel tends to be a much harder um, culture, you know. Uh, so... Uh, in the course of traffic, one guy accidentally rear-ended the other guy. The guy who got rear-ended got out of the car, went to the guy who hit him, pulled him out of the car, and started beating him up. Now, the guy who got hit was a secular Jew, and the guy who hit him was a religious Jew and looked like a religious Jew, black suit, hat, whatever, whatever he looks like. I don't know. He had pants. I don't know. I don't know. The, bottom line, you got a secular guy who got rear-ended by a Haredi guy. Okay. As the one guy is giving the other guy makot, right, punches, every time the guy landed a punch, the religious guy would, would put his arms up and say, Magiali, Magiali, I deserve it, I deserve it. Okay? So the secular guy was taken off guard by that because the guy didn't fight back. He wasn't cursing him, he wasn't pun- throwing punches back. And so this went on. Again, he punched him. Again, he said, Magiali, 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 I deserve it. So after three or four times of this happening, this guy's landing these punches and the religious guy is going, Magiali, Magiali. The guy says, what's wrong with you? Why are you, what, what are you doing? Why are you saying Magiali? Why are you not fighting back? Like what, what's, what's wrong with you? 
He said, I know that everything is mishamayim. If this happened, it's for a reason. And Magieli, I deserve it. I deserve these punches. I deserve to have this accident. I deserve these punches. And I'm sorry. I'm sorry for your inconvenience. I'm sorry for any damage. And I'll make sure that I make good on everything. Needless to say, the guy was astounded. He, this was completely the opposite of what anybody would ever expect. So the secular guy said to the religious guy, were you always like this? Like, what, what is this all about? And, and the religious guy said, no, I'm, I'm Baal Tshuva, and I study Torah, and it's been several years now, and I, I've just come to understand that everything is from Hashem, and that if this happened, it's also from Hashem, and it's also for my best. And if I'm getting punches right now, it's because I deserve it, because I did something at some point in my life, and these punches are going to help make me a better person. These punches are a kapara for something I did that I, I have to rectify, and I accept it, I accept it, I accept it. Magia, the guy was completely blown away absolutely blown away so he said really all of this 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 you became like that because of studying Torah and he said yeah this is this is you know because when you really study Torah like when you not just an intellectual endeavor when you really take it to heart and you let the Torah go into you it changes you it changes you as a human being you know, that's the whole idea behind studying Torah. It's meant to elevate you and elevate the world. The guy was so intrigued, he couldn't believe it. Then, of course, he says, I'm, I'm, I'm so sorry that I hit you. I, I, I acted inappropriately. And, and please, you know, how, please forgive me. I'm so embarrassed that I, that I reacted with such rage. And, you know, and anyway, long story short... The guys exchange numbers, and the Haredi guy says to the guy, listen, you know, I, I, listen, here's my number. If you want, call me. We can study together. I'm happy to study with you. Anytime you're free, tell me. I'll study with you. I'll, I'll show you the ropes, and I'll introduce you. And, and, you know, who knows? You never know. And so in the end, that's what happened. And they started studying regular together. And the guy was Jose Bachuva and became religious. And there's an actually even funnier part of the story that the guy had uh, no, he wasn't married and he didn't have any children, but he had a dog named Igor. Okay. And the guy showed up one day to the shul to study with his new friend and he's bawling. He's crying his eyes out. What happened? Are you okay? Is everything okay? He said, my dog died. My dog Igor died. And I'm devastated, you know, he was my, my companion and, and, you know, went everywhere with me and this and that. And, and a couple days later, he comes back to the synagogue and he says, you know, I really want to, I see that, you know, in the synagogue, they name, they name things for people and they, they, they keep them in, in memory and memoriam and they name things. I really want to do something special for Igor. You know, I want to give money. I want to name the shul. I want to name the shul for, for my dog. I want to name the shul. So the Haredi guy says, I, I, I don't know if that's something that's done. I don't know if we can name places after dogs. I, I really need to speak to the Rav. I have to find out for you. So he goes to the Rav. And he said, listen, this guy wants to name the shul after his dog. He wants to give you all this money to help promote Torah learning in a place, in a makam Torah. So the rabbi says, what's the dog's name? He said, Igor. He said, Igor. Okay. Igor, it's a person's name. Nobody will know that it's a dog. Okay, let's do it. So there's a Beit Knesset Igor somewhere in Israel. I forget exactly where. But this man gave a ton of money and renamed the shul after his dog. And there's a Beit Knesset Igor. So all of this from what? All of this from a quote-unquote accident, right? Which we know there are no accidents. The intention behind the Haredi guy in wanting to handle the situation in such a way that with Yerash Shamaim and a pure heart, and look at all that came from that. So we see that out of something, there's a Hebrew saying, mi, 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 mar, yotze, matok, something like that. It's, you know, from bitterness can come sweet. 
basically. There, it's a it's a phrase in Hebrew. I'm forgetting exactly how it goes, but the whole idea that hakol le tova, anything that even appears bad, we know is still le tova, always le tova. And so we have to walk in the world with understanding a few different things. That there is an intention from Shemaim behind everything and that the expectation upon us is that we will also have intention in everything that we will do and that it will be an honest intention. If we have conflict and strife in our life, we have problems in relationship, we are doing things that are not so honest, right? Someone else might not know that it's not honest because we put on a good show. But internally, we know somewhere deep inside, it's not aligned. It's not in alignment. The action and the intention are not in alignment, right? We see that a lot with kina, with jealousy, when people are internally jealous. Some people, they, they're jealous, but they don't even know they're jealous, or they don't, they don't want to be jealous. Some people are actively jealous. They want what someone else has, right? Hashem knows everything. He knows all of the intentions behind all of our feelings and all of our thoughts. I want to share an example with you. This is a real-life example. You have to remember, I was a clinical psychotherapist for 20 years. Okay, I have a lot of examples of different things, and this one I'm going to share you about intention. Divorced family, okay? Father didn't have any money. No money. Okay? The mother of the kids remarried after the divorce to one of the richest men in a particular state in the United States. I'm going to keep everything as as anonymous as possible. Okay? Father, after several years, finally starts to make some money. Buys a house, maybe a new car. And of course, the children, who are now young adults, you know, they're happy for him. They're very happy for him. And there are still children on the child support. But most of the adults are grown. But he's got one or two that are under the age of 18. Oh, no, it was one. One under the, 18, under the age of 18. 17 and a half, right? So six months left on the child support. Because at 18 or graduating high school, you graduate out from child support services. And that, that money was going to be stopping now. Okay, child says to the mother, wow, I'm so happy, dad has this now, dad has that now. Now the child doesn't know about the mother's intentions or the mother's internal workings or the mother's feelings. The child is sharing because the child's happy for the father to see that the father, finally after all these years, has a leg to stand on. Make sense? So let's talk about intention and action. The mother says to the child, Wow, that's so amazing. I'm so happy for him. That's wonderful. Big smile. Now remember, she has $300 million in the bank. Okay? Shortly thereafter, the father receives a notice from Child Support Services. The mother is requesting an increase in child support for the last six months and that the father should be audited by child support services. So you tell me, does intention always match action? Now that there's a happy ending to that story. The child support services saw through that very quickly, saw the age of the child, saw the wealth of the mother, saw the, you know, the circumstances of the father, and literally threw the case out. Okay? But the mother was all smiles to the child. I'm so happy for him. That's so wonderful. And the hour later calls the child support services to open an audit in a new case. So you see that just because somebody looks and sounds like they have a nice intention, God knows if they have a nice intention. We may not always know, but God knows everything. Right? And in Shemaim, in 120 years, after we've left Olam Azeh, and we go to learn what we've earned, if anything, for Olam Haba, we sit in front of the Beistin, and they run us through all of it. Remember when you did this? It looked really nice, but look what your thoughts were. Remember when you gave that tzedakah? You had a smile on your face, but inside it was ripping your heart out because you didn't want to separate from the dollar. So you don't get full credit for that mitzvah because your intention was not pure. <coughs> Make sense? So when you, yes, Julia. 
Thank you. Uh, I I think that oftentimes there are whole lectures devoted to even if you don't want, you should still do the mitzvah anyway. Your heart will catch up. So um, the penalty of not doing it with a pure heart seems to exist until we reach that complete pure heart selflessness. So does that mean that every time we do the right thing, even if we don't want to, like, is it or do we not get the full credit un, until we reach that high state of never feeling completely generous with with everything because obviously that small percentage that we're withholding uh it sounds very detrimental in the long run so i'll tell you two things and i love the word that you just used withholding i think that's a great way uh, let's start with that you have to remember again i, I can't say it enough Hashem runs the world on Mida Keneged Mida. If you are going to withhold, he is going to withhold. This is fact, right? Whatever we withhold, he will withhold. Whatever we give, he will give. It's Mida Keneged Mida. Now, throughout all all of Torah literature, when you're talking about any action, whether it's tzedakah, chesed, tefillah, davening, always it says, na'aset v'nishma, always, meaning the action is the action, and if you take the action, it counts. It counts. Now, there are some things I've read, and specifically related to davening, where it says, better to not say a tefillah, better to not say an empty tefillah, meaning like, Better to not say the tefillah than to say a tefillah where your mind is somewhere else or you have no kavana. I've also read the opposite, meaning davening is not, especially in our age, in our generation, davening is not easy. It's not simple. And it's very, we are at such a low level in general in, in the human you know, condition right now as we lead up to the days of, of Mashiach, Bezad Hashem that we don't have the same abilities that the generations before us had, especially, of course, the gedolim are the gedolim, right? We, we aspire and, and try to learn from how they did it and what they do. But I've, I've read also that by taking the action of davening, Hashem still wants to see you show up. Your kavana may not be perfect. Your mind may be wandering. You'll pull yourself back again and then you're thinking again about the grocery list and then you'll pull yourself back again and you're thinking about what you forgot to do yesterday and you pull yourself back again and on and on and this dance continues while you're in your position of davening. But you're showing up. You're showing up, right? And Hashem counts that. He counts that. He wants to see that you at least had the sense of mind to to show up. How many Jews in the world are just not even showing up? Like it's not even on their radar that davening is a daily activity. So forget about Kavana. That's like not even a part of the conversation. The fact that they open a sitter even once a year, or maybe Rosh Hashanah or Yom Kippur, it's like a big deal for millions and millions of Jews. So if you are of the level where you're actually picking up a sitter every day and trying and you're showing up, so this counts, this counts. And it's like anything, it's like anything, you have to build the muscles, you have to build the practice. It's something that you build and that's why you own it in Shamaim when you leave here in 120 years and you go in front of the base in Shamala, you show what you've earned, it's yours, you own it, no one can take it from you. All the effort that you put in, all the struggle, all the toil that you have to try to show up every day, to try to focus your mind to have kavana, to try to put your heart and soul into your davening, into your chesed, into your tzedakah, to give with a smile and really actually mean it. All of this, all of this toil and struggle you bring with you because Hashem sees and knows everything. And so it's well worth your while simply showing up also counts. And then you build from there and you grow it and you develop it and you make it your own. So that in 120 years, you're coming to Shemaim. It said, Avraham Babi Amim. Avraham came with days, meaning he made the most of every minute. He brought his days with him. They were not empty. 
And that's really our goal here. Our goal is to bring our days with us. Whether it's one thing we've done in a day, or whether it's a thousand things we've done in a day, or whatever it is, we want to have a full basket when we go to Shemaim. We don't want to show up naked. In Shemaim, our clothing is our mitzvot. Our clothing is our action. Our clothing is our intention. You don't want to show up naked to the court because the busha, the embarrassment, there's nowhere to hide. The busha ends up being part of the Gehenim that you pay for whatever you've done. Can you imagine going here in Los Angeles or wherever you live and showing up naked in the court? So imagine it's a gazillion times worse in Shemaim that you come empty, lack of mitzvot. Chas v'shalem, chas v'shalem lo'leinu. So anything and everything you do counts. And the more you can elevate it with your intention, even better, even more powerful. Make sense? All right. I want to give you guys some sources because I thought this stuff was fantastic. What Rabbi Mizrahi sent me was fantastic. So in Yirmiyahu, it says that Hashem is the choker. He is the researcher slash detective. Right? He is the one who's going in. He's doing the investigation. All right? He goes into the heart of the people. He examines our kidneys. He gives a person according to his intention. The Malbim explains that actions come out according to the inner nefesh. The inner nefesh. So the inner nefesh is tied to various organs of ours. Okay? And God can see the root of where every action is coming from. So he can understand the purity of your action or if it's tarnished with any kind of, like Julia said, withholding or ill will or maybe it's jealousy or maybe it's, you know, you're, you're, it's hard for you to give or whatever it is that's, that's discoloring that mitzvah. Hashem is able to be the detective to see every single intention behind every action, every thought and every word. Okay, in the Shulchan Orach, Rabbi Yosef Karo says you must work hard to have kavana in the tefillah. So this is tied to what we were talking about, and he gives a piece of advice: How do we do this? How do we work to have kavana in the tefillah? He said, imagine in your heart when you are stepping up to Davin to a Kodesh Baruch Hu, imagine that you are actually standing in front of a real king. How would you behave? How would you hold yourself? What would your demeanor be? What would your facial expression be? What would your energy be? Imagine, prepare yourself for standing in front of a real king and now raise that to be Hashem. That the king is Hashem and that you're standing in front of Hashem and you're standing in front of an, an, uh, in front of an omniscient, all-knowing king. He knows your kavana and he knows your intention. So using your imagination to pretend that you're standing in front of a king will be able to elevate you as you're standing in front of Hashem. In the Gemara, Tana Abba Shaul hints in Tehillim. He says, Tachin libam, takshiv oznecha. When the heart is in the right place, God can hear you. Meaning, your, your davening is more clear, it's more pristine, it's more pure when you prepare yourself before you stand up to go in front of a Kaddish Baruch Hu. When you prepare yourself before you give tzedakah, give your tzedakah intention. Say, I want to alleviate the suffering of the Shekhinah by giving this tzedakah. And in Shemaim, you're getting credit for helping the Shekhinah. I want to give this in the schutz of Rafua Shlema for so and so. And in Shamaim, the credits of your tzedakah, of your efforts, are going, God willing, towards the Rafua Shlema of someone or the Shiduch of someone. You are directing your energy because you're giving it intention. And Hashem takes all of that into account. Chazal explained that the greatest obstacle between us and fulfilling mitzvot with Kavana is because we do things either without intention completely or from social pressure. So a good example of this would be if a man is in, in Minyan, right? And there's a certain pressure you have to show up to Minyan. If you're only coming to davening because you have pressure to show up to Minyan, you're losing the majority of, of what you have potential to earn. Why not make the most of where you have to be, right? And, and what you're doing. Uh, okay. Again in, in Yeshayahu, Navi says, Mitzvat anashim 
Milvamad, Mil, Mel, Melvmada, excuse me. They honor me with their tongue, but their words are far from their hearts. When Yeshayahu was prophesying, Hashem spoke through him to say, I hear your words, but I see that your heart is not in your words. The mouth is moving, but it's disconnected from the heart. This ties directly to the idea of intention. So Chazal say, how do you prevent doing a mitzvah and having either, God forbid, ill intention or no intention? A kavana that's, that's empty, right? How do you prevent it? It says every single time before you go to do a mitzvah, do everything you can to think about the detail of what is required in that mitzvah. So for example, lighting Shabbos candles. Before you light Shabbos candles, before you step up to light the match and say the bracha and light your candles, step back 30 seconds, 60 seconds, and say to yourself, I am about to welcome Shabbat HaMalka. What does that mean? What am I trying to accomplish here? Shabbat is the core foundation of all of the religion, of all of the Torah. Everything is revolving around Shabbat. To be Mechal El Shabbos, Chas Shalom is one of the greatest Averos that can take place in the, in the scope of Torah. So clearly it's important to Hashem. So to take a few minutes and center yourself and think about the mitzvah. My husband, when he was going through this with me, he explained to me something that he does personally that I was not aware of before when he's putting tefillin. He said, it's very easy for people to throw on the tefillin. They put it on. They say what they need to say. They take it off. They wrap it up. They put it back in the bag. He said, I, a long time ago, I memorized the, all of the uh, instructions from the Ben Ishchai of how to put the tefillin. He said, so when I am putting tefillin, I am saying those instructions to myself out loud, not out loud with words, but it, you know, in my mind. I'm saying, okay, I have to, the Ben Ishchai says, that's how he, how he begins. I begin to say, the Ben Ishchai says, and then he goes through everything. He goes through exactly what the Ben Ishchai says about the order in which you tie the strap and how you tie the strap. And he's talking himself through the entire process until he has all of his tefillin on. And then when he's done, instead of just ripping it off and folding it up and putting it in the bag, he does the exact same thing. The Ben Ishchai says, in order to take off my tefillin, I need to do, and then he starts to do as he's telling himself exactly what the Ben Ishchai said to do. Very, very powerful. I never thought about it before. He said, Mia, it's impossible to have kavana in your action if you're not going to tie yourself to either something you read from a tzaddik or something that's written in the Gemara or something that's coming straight from Torah to be able to root and ground your kavana and your intention before an action. He said, Chazal talks about the fact that anything you want to elevate, you need to educate yourself first. So, staka, you're going to give staka. Why do we give staka? What is the significance of this mitzvah? What are we trying to accomplish here? Talk to yourself about it first before you give it. Hafrashat chala, what are you doing? Lighting Shabbos candles, what are you doing? Davening shachrit, what are you doing? Sitting and, 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 and having a Pesach Seder. What are we doing? Talk to yourself when you're setting the table for the Pesach Seder. I am about to set the table for one of the most monumental and historic events for all of Am Yisrael that ever happened. In fact, almost everything that we discuss in davening and in Torah is surrounding Yitziat Mitzrayim. How many times we hear Yitziat Mitzrayim, Yitziat Mitzrayim, Yitziat Mitzrayim, what Hashem did for us in Yitziat Mitzrayim. If it's mentioned so many times, we understand it's important. When we're getting ready for any Chag, we have coming up sometime soon Tu What is it? What does it mean? Why are we doing it? Why do we have a Tu Seder? What's the significance? Okay? So we ground ourselves by having intention, setting our intention, educating ourselves, and tying our action 
to something that we've learned, and most importantly, tying that to our hearts. And by weaving all of those things together, we elevate every action that we take. Right? So, someone's writing in the chat. It is so true. When I learn something, it brings such a new meaning to my mitzvah. Absolutely. It's helpful to do this by teaching your kids and asking them questions while it's done. Amazing. Fantastic approaches. I love it. Absolutely. That's the best way to teach kids and to teach them how to have intention. Get them thinking. Get them asking questions. Talk with them about it. Okay? So, as usual, I like to give a little bit of homework. Um, I always encourage all my students to have journals and to continue to take notes. So, let me give you a couple questions and things to think about uh, between now and next week that you can really integrate this concept of intention and understand what it is, why we need it, and ultimately how we answer for it in Shamaim in 120 years in the Basti in Shamala. Everybody operates from a different space. Some people operate because they like to do things that are, they know are, are the right thing or a good thing or mitzvah. But other people are also operating from a, pra- from a place of awe. You know, I would almost use the word fear because when I think about standing in front of the base Dean Shalmala, my, my knees quake, right? Like uh, it, 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 it motivates me to want to get up and daven. It motivates me to want to do the right things according to the eyes of Hashem. It motivates me to want to be able to stand in front of the Beistin Shalmala and feel proud of what I've brought with me. Okay? When you have a constant reflection about the fact that you will answer for everything you've done in this lifetime and that there is nowhere to hide, right? It says in Avos, there's an eye that sees and an ear that hears. Everything. Everything is recorded, including your thoughts. So there is no hiding. So the sooner you come to terms with that, Shalmala means above. Shalmala means from above. Okay? So there's an eye that sees and an ear that hears. So when I say Beistin Shalmala, it means the, the Beistin of the high court where they're making judgments on people as they pass and they come in front of the court. Everybody has their moment in front of the court. Okay? There's no getting around it. This is the system. Okay? So, if you want to use it you, in whatever way works for you, but the idea here with this shiur is to understand that whether you are aware or unaware, it will impact you. I used the example before of gravity. Gravity does not care if you believe in it. Right? Your belief in gravity is not what keeps you rooted on the planet. Gravity is going to work on you whether you like it, don't like it, believe in it. They don't, gravity does not care. Gravity is gravity. It's the same thing with the Yetzirah. The Yetzirah doesn't care if you believe in him. Or you don't. In fact, he would love it if you don't believe in him. Because then he can have his way with you much, much easier. Okay? So, certain things, certain aspects of Torah, we have to understand, are going to influence and impact us regardless of our personal opinion of them. Intention is one of them. Intention is one of those things that you cannot run from. In the end of the day... You will be made to answer for your intention behind everything. And it will be shown to you. And when you try to convince the Beistin, because you're trying to convince yourself that somehow you were okay when you weren't, they're going to show you right in your face what your intention was. And you're going to understand everything in the flash of a second. Okay? So we might as well begin the work now, while we still have the benefit of doing mitzvot in a physical body in Olam Hazeh, and we can begin to build and continue to build for Olam Haba. So here are the questions that I would pose to you to help you in that process. Where in your life you have to make an examination of your relationships, all the various relationships that you have, the positions that you hold, the roles that you play, right? And the activities that you are involved with in whatever way and ask yourself, where do I have ill intent? Another way to ask that question is, where are my intentions not pure or not clean and clear? Where is there a 
a, a disconnect between what I'm doing and saying and what I'm actually feeling internally. And then slowly begin to rectify that. Now, I want to pause for one second and just say, there are mitzvot that are harder for some people than are for others. This is usually areas in which we have tikkunim. We have things that we came in this world to correct about ourselves. Right? Kivud avaem is a very, very easy mitzvah for some people and the most difficult mitzvah for other people. Okay? The fact that you feel that it's difficult doesn't necessarily mean you have a bad intention. It just means it's difficult and that you have to work on making it easier for yourself, that you come to a place of peace with whatever it is you need to do in that arena. Okay? But if you're helping someone and in the same moment in your mind you're wishing that they die, God forbid, this is ill intent. Okay? This is ill intent. So we have to ask ourselves... Where do we have ill intention? Where are our actions and our words not resonating with the MS, with the truth? If people are resentful about a certain person in their life with whom they still must be giving, affectionate, respectful, what prayer or exercise can we do to alleviate that resentment so that our relationship to them can be pure? So, um, always Tehillim can help. Centering yourself before you have any interaction with that person to again say, I am doing this for Kivud. I'm using this as an example. I'm not saying that's what your issue is. Uh, for Kivud Ava'em. And then you do the action. So now immediately you've recentered yourself to not make it about that person, but make it about the mitzvah. The more you're able to make it about the mitzvah and less about the person that you have a problem with, the easier time you're going to have to do it. Because you're understanding you're doing it for a higher reason. You're doing it for a higher purpose and a higher power. Hashem put that person in your life to be exactly who they are so that you elevate yourself. So you can look at every single relationship you have like that to say, okay, I can either engage with them at my base level, emotional, you know, triggered points where um, I'm, I'm having so much difficulty or I'm going to kind of pull myself back a little bit emotionally and I'm going to try to elevate my, my engagement and elevate my intention so that I understand that this person is really an opportunity for me. And doesn't necessarily have to be a challenge for me, even though it may be challenging. Does that make sense? So doing an exploration, an investigation, like Hashem says, he's the detective. The more you are your own detective now, while you are in this olam, the better off you're going to be in 120 years. Guaranteed. Better that you should do the detective work than Hashem has to do the detective work. Because... You may choose not to be honest with other people, but if you choose to be dishonest with yourself, and in the end you're going to answer to Hashem, He's going to show you exactly, point blank, where, where you were holding at any given time. Okay? So we want to finish this lifetime better off than how we came in. Preferably, we would like to leave the people around us and the places around us in better condition when we leave this world than when we came. We always want to try to leave people and places in better situations than when we came onto the scene. Right? So that we are builders and not destroyers. Chas v'shalem. Okay? The second question is, how much thought and consideration are you giving to your intentions behind your actions? So whether that's mitzvot, or whether that's your parenting, or whether that's your spouse... Whether that's your tzedakah, your chesed, whatever it is, how much are you actually thinking about things before you're actually doing them so that you are setting yourself up to be someone who works through intent, positive intent, healthy intention. Okay, the last question repeating, how much thought are you actually giving behind your action and your intention. So are you setting yourself up for success is another way to say that. Success in your davening, success in your relationships, success in your mitzvahs, right? Myself personally, I find that when I'm really fatigued, I have much less patience and I have much less ability to set a proper intention, right? So part of being able to set good intention 
especially for the for women who have a tremendous amount of responsibility generally speaking is to have an element of self-care and have that also be with intention to be of service to God and others. Self-care can be a very selfish thing or self-care can be a very giving thing. And the only difference between the two is your intention. Understand? So when you say I need to go for a facial every day and I need a massage every day and I need me time, right? So that can be very, very selfish. But if you are doing some of those things for the sake of being able to rejuvenate and refresh and be a giver, so you are giving at a higher level, that's a whole other ball game. And Hashem knows the truth of what your intentions are. If you need to take a nap at three o'clock before the kids come home so that you can be a present mother when they do come home, and that's your intention for taking a nap and not hiding from your other responsibilities, so that's a noble nap. Let's call it a noble nap because you're taking that nap because you want to show up at a higher level. Make sense? Um, Do you have any tips or starters to get us thinking and preparing ourselves to be our best with husbands, kids, etc. So, so when I, I, something I started doing a while back is usually I have a conversation with my husband on the phone before he's coming home from work. I don't know if that's like a common thing or not, but you know, your husband or your you know spouse or will call you and I'm on the way home. Okay, great. You know, dinner's going or whatever. And I take a few minutes in that window of time between the time I know he's coming home and the time he walks in the door to try to ground myself to give him some presence and attention. And I, I, it doesn't always work, right? Because you never really know what's going on in the house and the phone is ringing and the kids and so on and so forth. But I do have a clear intention that I would like to do that. And I think most of the time I'm successful if I can catch myself and make sure I'm conscious enough to set that intention. It's the same thing with the kids. Like I was saying, there's a certain element of mental preparation that should take place before your kids get in the car from carpool or walk in the door from a day of school. Generally speaking, I think in most houses, that's kind of a little bit of a chaotic time until the kids get in and settle down and what's your homework and what's for dinner and all of that stuff, right? I have learned that uh, by clearing my quote-unquote day or mind for that 30 minutes, and not answering phone calls unless it's emergent, God forbid, um, and just giving the space to allow for that transition, it helps a lot more in my intention and how I'm able to show up. So I think giving yourself space, giving yourself those few minutes to ground yourself and set your intention behind how you want to be is a great way to start. And then, you know, it's like anything. The more you practice, the more it becomes a second nature. You know, the the more you give, the easier it is to give. That's with everything, right? The more you give and the more your heart opens, the more you're able to give. For most people, there are some people that have a very, very serious tikkun with giving. Really, very serious. Like, that's the reason that they're back here in a body, And it's painful for them to give. And that's something that they have to work through. But for the vast majority of people where they don't have like a serious tikkun issue with this, the more you give, the more your heart opens, you know, the more you're honest with yourself and your intention, the more you're kind to yourself and not judgmental about, oh, this time I was a failure, this time I'm a successful. It's it's not about uh, your uh, scorecard. It's really about becoming a better human being in the eyes of Hashem. In the end of the day, that's what all of this is about. That's what the shiurim are about. That's what your efforts are about. Is showing up in Shamayim after Hashem has given you X number of years in this body on this planet to show Him that you made the most of the time He granted you. Okay? How do you help your family to be better givers as well? I think the best way to do that is by role modeling it. Model it for them. Model it for them. A lot of people, especially adults, they're not going to get it by you telling them what they need to do. In fact, oftentimes that has a, a, an opposite effect. People don't want to be lectured to and they don't want to be told what to do and how to do it, okay, in general. If it's done as a, as a kind and loving musar in a quiet moment and not in the heat of a moment, so maybe you're going to have an opening here or there. 
But the best thing you can possibly do is be a living, breathing example of what you want to see from other people. And the feedback that you get over time, that's not something that changes like a light switch, although it could. The feedback that you get over time is telling you how are you progressing. Now, again, you don't have to take responsibility for other people's actions and behaviors. You're responsible for yourself. But in general, if one person changes, it doesn't really give other people an option. They either need to change or they're going to have a very difficult time in the situation, right? It takes two to tango. So all the time when you're doing couples therapy, you know, if one spouse changes, the other spouse is faced with a very serious question. Either I need to get on board and change or I need to go. Because you're going to choose to stay and not change when, when someone is trying to grow. It's going to be very complicated, right? So change in one always influences change in others. If a mother changes her parenting strategy and the kids are suddenly realizing that all the whining and stomping and crying and fits that used to eventually wear her down and get them what they wanted are no longer working because the mother has now a new approach and a new strategy, they, they will catch on very quickly. You just have to be consistent. So change in one thing typically will influence change in others. I feel like asking sometimes for help even when you don't need it from everyone. Maybe that would help them develop. Yeah, why not? Absolutely. Asking for help is a great way to approach things. 100%. Because it's non-threatening. Asking someone for help, it's, it's, not, it's not a threatening posture. When you come at someone and tell them you have to do it like this and you have to do it and you're like this and you're like that and you da 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 so that's a very threatening posture and it automatically puts people on the defensive. When you come and ask for help, so it's a, whole, it's, a, it's a different energy, completely different energy. Most people, if they're decent human beings, are going to want to help, whatever it is, you know? Um, so that's a great approach. I love that approach. So, okay, so this is my Shira on intention for you guys. I want to open it up. If anyone has any questions, yes, Golda. I have many. Okay. First of all, I love, thank you so much for that distinction between uh, giving and selfish self-care because I always struggled with it. I was like always feeling, intuitively I knew I need to do self-care. It was just like on a very deep intuitive level, but I always felt so guilty and just like puts it in such a clear perspective. So thank you for that. You're welcome. <laughs> um, okay, so I came in a little later, so I don't know if you spoke about it, but my obvious question is, what about the Toch Shalom Lishma Balishma? How does that come in into your version of Kavana? Um, you were all taught. Listen. So translate it for for everyone who's not Hebrew speaking. Yeah, sorry. Um, I believe it's in Kirtavis, I don't know the source, but it says if you do uh, mitzvahs and any good deeds without the kavana, not for the sake of, of Hashem's glory, eventually will turn around, that it will turn into Hashem, uh, the sake of Hashem's glory. Exactly, and so that's a little bit what we talked about, the whole idea of Nasev and Ishma, which is basically when you are starting to do something and you're leading yourself with action, that the rest of you will catch up. Do you know, what I, you know what I'm saying? So the idea, sometimes the hardest part is just the first step, right? Sometimes the hardest part is just opening the sitter. Sometimes the hardest part is, is, is just, um, you know, I, I think I talk about this in one of my previous lectures that there are five stages to change. And, and one of the initial stages is literally thinking about making a change. Literally, the initial stage is just the thought about that you want to make a change. We can't make any changes. We cannot implement anything without that initial seed level thought. And that's why the very, 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 very first year was all about the idea of thought. And that plays very much into this. So the idea that doing something leads eventually to an understanding and an appreciation and a depth and a richness and then a fulfilling intention behind it is, is a very, very real. Because a lot of times we start doing things and then we say, oh, you know, this isn't so bad. Or I can find meaning in this where I didn't find meaning in it before. 
And so it's the same thing. It's like flexing a muscle. It's like building a muscle, like when you're exercising, right? You get stronger every time you exercise, you break down muscle and then you rebuild muscle and you become stronger after. It's the same mental game. You break down old patterns and habits and ways of thinking and you build new habits and ways of thinking. And that leads you to higher space. Did I answer your question? Um, I think so. You're saying it's not a contradiction. It's, it's not a contradiction. Yeah. Okay. No, it's not a contradiction at all. Because, again, I always say we're not robots. We're people. Everybody has a different way of learning. Everyone has a different approach. Um, and, and like I said, it's written both ways in various sources. Some say, don't daven unless you have keten- uh, uh, kavana, you know, intention. Um, it's an empty prayer. And other people say, no, 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 it's exactly the opposite. You have to daven until you're able to get yourself to a space that you have an intention and you have a more meaningful and rich prayer. There was actually something here that you're reminding me in, um, in the, the book Olam Haba from Rav Avigdor Miller. He talks about um, the idea that it's a great accomplishment to behave externally as you are thinking and behaving in your mind. That those two things should get to the, the level where they're congruent with one another. He says, there's no question that what transpires in the mind is of the absolute greatest importance. The Avos lived with the maxim to know what is above, an eye that sees and an ear that hears. They understood that it means that Hashem is looking to our minds and sees our thoughts. And so you have to know that if you're doing something, you're saying, you know what, I want to begin to daven. I want to come closer to my creator. I want to give kavod to a Kaddish Baruch Hu. I want to grow as a human being. Imagine that a child comes to a parent and says, Ima, you know, I really want to start doing X, Y, and Z. And I went, as a parent, you're like, amazing, that's wonderful. How can I help you? Why would it be any different with a Kaddish Baruch Hu? We are his children. He wants us to draw closer to him. The second he sees that we take even one one millimeter closer to him, we're lighting him up. We're, we're giving him uh, nachas from us, Right? He doesn't expect from us perfection. He expects from us the best that we can be, whatever that means. And if it means we're better today than we were yesterday, if we're taking actions even if we don't fully understand them, but we're, we're working in that direction, so wouldn't any parent be proud to see their child moving in the right direction, quote-unquote, moving closer to him? So we, ha- we have to look at it that, yes, there is Dean and there is Dayan, there is judge and judgment. And the world is run on Mida, Kenegan Mida, but Hashem loves us. He loves us. He wants to see us succeed. He wants to see us be close to Him. And so everything He's doing is also woven within the context of a love of a parent for the child. Right? We, we are His portion. Am Yisrael is His Am Kadosh that He chose. So with everything, even with all of our faults and, and with our abilities or inabilities that he gave us, right, we, we have to know that we, we are loved and he wants to see us succeed. But it's up to us to do that work. It's up to us to take the steps and to build our intention and our motivation. Make sense? Rav Avi Dormiller, we'll close with this. Rav Avi Dormiller says, if you sit down for one minute and think, Hashem is looking at me, Hashem is looking at me, it's going to leave an impression on you. Try it sometime. Try it to help build your intention. The Navi said, we secretly walk with Hashem. That means always keep in your mind the awareness that Hashem is looking at us and that He is with us. And that helps a person to build their intention and to build their skill and to draw closer to a Kaddish Baruch Hu. I have a question. Yeah. Dr. Nia, I believe that was a while ago you mentioned that when we are starting to take something new, some new change, that we, it's recommended that we do it in a different way. I don't know. I think... I don't know if I got it correctly, so please forgive me sure. if I if I do. But it's like if you're going to take a, a new mitzvah or take a new habit, uh-huh. I don't know, hair covering or 
I don't know, um, embracing Sabbath, that you do it maybe in a, in a different way than maybe you should be doing it. I don't know what is the reasoning behind. It's just to maybe to shock our brain and then maybe to get it started. I don't know. I do not get it. I, I, I don't remember. I don't remember saying that. I don't, does anyone else remember what she's referring to? I'm not, I'm not sure. I think that, I mean, I can just off the top of my head with your question, I think that anytime we pick up something new, um, we have to, there's always a process, right? It's the same thing like riding a bicycle. The vast majority of people don't jump on a bike and ride away without some falls, some leaning to the side, somebody holding the back of the seat and helping us, you know. So I think a part of anything new is also that, that piece of education and that each time trying to do it better, trying to do it more quote unquote correct, more in alignment with what's necessary. Listen, the thing with Judaism, although there's always like, there's, there's always a joke that, you know, you can always find that loophole. You can always find that, that one rub that posect that way, right? That you, that you want to find support for your, for your position or the way you're doing something, right? That's the beauty of Judaism is that we do have so many voices and so many recorded voices throughout history and there's so much to learn from all of them Um, but at the same time Judaism and Torah it's precise it's very precise so it's like anything if you want to send an email you have to make sure that you have all the correct letters and numbers and spaces and dots and so forth because otherwise it's not going to reach the sender so when we're doing mitzvot we really do need to educate ourselves about you know, the proper way in which to do it. Um, and, it and, and based on this class, also the proper intention within which to do it. Um, and there are, of course, different mean hagim, depending on upon your background and, you know, uh, all the different, you know, nusach and so on and so forth. So um, here, Julia saying, I recall something about elevating your surrounding or your setting or your clothes, something to mark that you are doing something. So yes, you absolutely you can do that. So I, I, I mean, maybe it was tied when I said I created for myself a space for prayer. Would that may, maybe have been it? No? It was after that, like, for example, Dr. Mia said to set apart a special... Yeah, so I, it could be. I mean, listen, I think anything that you do that is uh, with intention, you're going to elevate it. So... If you say, okay, I have these special clothes and this special kisui rosh for Shabbat and Chagim, right? And that's for Shabbat and it's not for Yom Chol. It's not for every day. It's for Shabbat. So that immediately elevates the, elevates the, the mitzvah, right? It elevates the, um, the clothing. It elevates what your intention is, right? If you're going to save something special for Shabbat, a lot of times, men also have special clothing for Shabbat and so forth. Okay, I actually have to go now. I just heard my husband walked in, and I don't want him on the recording. <laughs> so I'm wishing you guys all an amazing week, and thank you so much for coming. Be well, everybody. Bezat Hashem, see you next week. Bye.